Good evening and welcome to another episode of Toastmasters Bay to Bay, where we feature speakers from San Francisco all the way down to Monterey and beyond. My name is Stan Ng and I am your, your host for this very special episode of Toastmasters Bay to Bay. Now, if you've been watching our show for a long time, you have undoubtedly realized that things look a little bit different here. Well, what's going on? Well, we have a, in Toastmasters, we have an advanced communications manual called Communicating on Video. And we have decided to take over one episode so that we can have five Toastmasters work on projects from that manual. So the format tonight will be an interview, a 10-minute interview, followed by a three-minute editorial, followed by another 10-minute interview. And in that way, we can have five people, five Toastmasters, get credit for projects from that manual. So this is our first uh, interview segment. We'll then go to Ben Cardenas, who will do give an uh, editorial piece, and we'll go to Dwani Shaw in the second half of the show. So my, my guest here is Elizabeth Barton. And uh, if you know anything about Toastmasters, it's all about stepping outside your comfort zone. And Elizabeth has done that in spades <laughs> through her life. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Stan. Let's talk about uh, an earlier part of your life. Uh, you were in the Army, weren't you? Yes, I was. I was with the um, 4th PSYOP Battalion. Um, I group first, and then I went to the 353rd PSYOP Battalion, and I ended up with the 478th Strategic Intelligence Detachment. So let's talk yes. about the PSYOPs thing a little mm -hmm. bit later. First, I'd like to bring up a picture of you uh, okay. <laughs> at, in, in action, let's say. Yes. So let's bring up a, a, a picture here. So this is, uh, this is you, and I, I told you earlier, <laughs> I couldn't help but think of Pri Private Benjamin <laughs> when I saw this picture. Could you tell us a little bit about what was going on there? Well, I was Private Benjamin with fangs, and uh, in that picture, I, it was war games, and the Special for uh, Forces was basically using us as fodder. They were practicing their techniques. So fodder as in yes uh, yeah okay okay yeah. they they were hunting you they down they were hunting us and they were expecting you to be killed and the majority were and i was the only one in my battalion to get a kill and this occurred because as a child i was trained by my stepfather to be he was a commando and when you were in your pup tent you had to sleep with your <laughs> weapon facing the the flap so when I heard the crackling of the bushes, I just rolled over and I shot. And there was an observer there, and I got a mark. So, <laughs> so that doesn't happen very often, does no, it? No, no, it didn't. Wow. So your your father gave you some some fatherly advice to. to oh, my stepfather, yes. Oh, your stepfather. Yeah. But wow. my father was a third degree black belt in judo, so I oh, got wow. many tips from him also. And my mother was one of the first women to receive her black belt in Canada. Wow! So you you got you got this uh, the, this uh, bad attitude from <laughs> all sides, right? <laughs> yes, it, it's from the wee little tot all the way up. That's great. That's great. <laughs> well, there, there's another picture of you as as um, as a range master, I think. Yeah, I, here you are. You're, you're you're instructing. Is that what you're doing? Where I'm having them in prone position and they're shooting their targets for qualification. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you. How did you fall into, uh, it, this is your specialty though, the, your, the, the, um, the firearms instruction? No, that was just a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. It was just one of the, the things, the uh, qualifications I picked up while I was in the Army. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. So you, were, you mentioned that you were in a PSYOP battalion. Yes. Now, can you explain what that is? A psychological operations battalion where you go into different cultures and you um, figure out how the culture works and functions and how to basically win them over to your, your, um, your side. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did you, is this something that you elected to go into? How did you fall into that? In the intelligence 
both my grandfathers were intelligence, um, basically agents, and I was always really intrigued with it. And I applied, and I was, you know, accepted. Wow, okay, okay. And then when I went into the Strat Mid, it was by inv invitation only. Strat Mid meaning? A, a, a strategic intelligence detachment. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that was by invitation only. Uh, why did you, why <laughs> were you invited? <laughs> this was way back when, when uh, during the Cold War, and um, I was at an NCO conference. Mm. They were talking about the Soviet Union and how they were going to be building up, and I got up and I basically said, the Soviet Union will be collapsed within eight years. What we have to worry about is low-intensity warfare, which they call terrorism now, with a religious bent. And there were some people listening, and um, I had written a paper on it, and they read it, and they invited me to join. So you'd written a paper on mm -hmm. these items of yes. global strategic... Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you... Well, that part was classified. Ah, yeah. okay. You, you could tell me, but then you'd have to kill me. Yeah. Well, it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So after you, you how, how long did you spend in the Army? Eleven years altogether. Eleven years, mm -hmm. wow. And you weren't, so you weren't just uh, a, a, a desk sergeant. You were, you were. First sergeant. First sergeant. Yeah, at the end. So you were trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat and, and all that. That was, you know, something I'd picked up, as like I said, in childhood. <laughs> oh, <laughs> another, all the way up. another one of your lethal mm -hmm. hobbies. Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. So when you, uh, we have another picture of mm. you after you left, or no, were I was you, in, I was you were still in the army. Yes. Can we, we show that <laughs> picture? Sure. So this this will show you. This is Elizabeth uh, while she was in the army. She yeah. was. Uh, I was doing my bodybuilding at that time. And I mean, uh, I was also jumping out of airplanes and, you know, doing other things. But uh, I mean, yeah. I was very strong. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you were, you were doing some And that very was uh, just for Miss, uh, Miss Santa Cruz. It was way back in, I think, 82. You were Miss Santa Cruz? Uh, a competition, yes. Oh, okay, okay. And I think I placed seventh. Oh, wow, wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you so know, see, what I do is I, I get a passion and I pursue it. And then once I achieve it, then I go to my next passion. So along those lines, mm. what was your next passion after? This, this is mm. what fascinates <laughs> me most about your story. After you came out of the Army as this, this mm. hunter killer, you described yourself as going through transformation. Uh, I yes. went and I started having mystical experiences. Mm. And eventually I s started really researching because I, my grandmother she was a mystic, a, a psychic, and I always tried to avoid that side of the family because I didn't want to be ridiculed. And then I realized as I got older, it's, it's a gift I have and I could help people. Really? And, and so did, you, did this gift get passed down through the generations? It's genetics, it's yeah. genetics, yeah. And my family's been psychics for thousands of years. Wow. Yeah. And so you do this as now I do it. Uh, it's, I've been doing this uh, with astrology, which is my ultimate passion, mm -hmm. Western astrology. Uh, for 13 years, I've had my own business, totally self-employed, um, and I don't do any advertising. So, and people <laughs> so find me. Purely word of, word of mouth. Yes. So what, can you describe what you do for your clients? I've studied many different energy techniques, hands-on healing, and when I'm working on a person, I get images and then I can talk to them about the images. Hmm. I'll give you an example. This one woman, she went to your regular doctors, the allopathic doctors, and they couldn't understand why her calves were cramping so badly. Hmm. And I put my hands on there, and I saw a little girl looking through a fence, and she was seeing a calf being slaughtered. Oh, wow. And any time she went into fear, she transferred it, you know, calf, calf, that's what uh, her brain did. Uh -huh. And so anytime she went into fear, really heavy fear, her calves would clamp up. And okay. as soon as she figured that out, it was gone. You know, wow. it was just things like that. And or I'd be working on a person and I'd see a big white plane flying and I'd say, I saw a white plane. And she says, oh, I'm from White Plains, Georgia. <laughs> you know, so you get all this information and symbols and then yeah. you have to translate it. 
And when I was first starting to do this, it was really, I would put my hands on a person and say, oh gosh, I can't say this, you know. They're going to think I'm nuts, but now I can do it. <laughs> you know, I don't care if they think I am. Well, so you have other aspects of your business as mm. well, right? You, you're, you're reverend. Yes, you actually I'm a reverend, and I, I marry people. Yeah. And I also do house clearings, which is my one of my favorite things to do hmm. when people have entities in their homes. And entities meaning spirits? Spirits or ghosts. Okay. And I go in with a team. I have a team, and we go in, and we clear the house. You go in with a team? Yes, because I also have the scientific part of my brain. Uh -huh. I want to figure out why this happens. Oh, wow. How is this possible? Uh -huh. you know, how can you have these little balls of light shooting around the room, but they're not registering on the EMF or the electromagnetic field meters? How is this possible? Wow. So it's, it's a curiosity. Yeah. yeah Luckily, say. I'm not a cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you, you do this energy work. You mm. do. Uh, what other what other portions of your of your work would you like to share with us? Well, my astrology, which is my favorite part. Okay. Um, I astrology chooses you, the real astrology. Yeah. Because it's not something that you would want to do, but it's like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle, trying to figure out all the different aspects, uh, and. Astrology, most people don't realize that almost all of the corporations have astrologers. They just don't tell you about it. Ah, really? In fact, uh, J.P. Morgan, and you can look this up on the web, he said millionaires don't have astrologers, billionaires do. He had like 20 astrologers on, on the books at all times. Really? Yes. And I know a couple of uh, my Vedic friends uh, do, that do the Indian astrology, uh -huh. they were hired by a consortium of businessmen to take the chart of the America, of the United States of America, and to what they call rectify it, to get it the, the correct time. Because if you have someone's chart or the country's chart, then you can figure out when they're weak or when they're strong and okay. how to make b business moves. You know, Elizabeth, yes. I, it, it just seems mm. like we can go forever and I'm, I'm going to catch up with you to, to talk more about this yes. but I, I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Yeah, I know it, it just flies, right? Oh, wow. Well, yeah. great. well thank you so much, Stan. It's been thank a Thank you very much for, for joining oh, us. Thank you. So <laughs> our next segment is going to be Ben Cardenas, uh, who's going to give an editorial opinion on an insidious disease. So please uh, here is Ben Cardenas. How long do you want to live? Long enough to enjoy an active retirement, playing golf, traveling the world, and caring for your grandchildren? I am obsessed with death, my own. My friends and family tell me it's an occupational hazard since I sell life insurance. The tragic events of Sandy Hook and the Boston Marathon are painful reminders of how quickly life can change. Unfortunately, however, those events were unforeseeable and out of the victim's control. But what I'm concerned about is getting sick and suffering from a disease which I can control. Last week, I was formally diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, a disease I've been fighting for over three years and hopefully hoping to prevent this diagnosis. Unfortunately, my predisposed genetics won over. Diabetes is a chronic condition that affects the way your body metabolizes sugar, our body's main source of fuel. Untreated, the disease is life-threatening. There are over 25 million people in the United States that have diabetes. There are an additional 7 million people undiagnosed with 70 million people more that are considered pre-diabetic. Over the last three years, I've had to change my diet and commit to a more disciplined exercise regimen. I reduced or virtually eliminated many of my favorite foods from my diet, including white rice, french fries, bacon, ketchup, and any food high in sugar or containing empty carbs. I've replaced them with healthier foods like avocados, apples, brown rice, broccoli, oatmeal, and foods high in omega-3s. I also eat more often 
and have also reduced the portion size of all my meals. As a result, I've lost 15 pounds and dropped a full clothing size. However, in spite of my efforts, my lab numbers continued to climb until I crossed that borderline number and became diabetic. I was told that if you have a family history of diabetes, it's not if, but when you develop the disease. My mother died at 75 years young from an assortment of health issues that included diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and obesity. When combined, these factors can cause coronary heart disease resulting in heart attacks, or in my mom's case, three strokes, and finally, congestive heart failure. All my life, I knew I was my mother's son. We have the same temperament and temper. We have the same drive. Now we also have the same disease, diabetes. What we don't have is the same lifestyle. My mom refused to watch her diet, refused to follow her doctor's orders, and refused to exercise. And the irony in this is that my mom was a nurse. I want to live to be 94 years old. I want to dance at my children's weddings and bounce my grandchildren on my knees and watch my beloved San Francisco Giants on TV. I want to enjoy an active retirement with both feet and 10 toes. And I want to see the world with 2020 eyesight. As an insurance agent, I know that people with diabetes live an average of five years less than those without the disease. I refuse to compromise my mortality. I will live to be 94. To do so means an even greater commitment to diet, exercise, and a healthy lifestyle. I have the love and support of my family to accomplish this goal, and they too have changed their diet and prepare foods that are good for all of us. They've sacrificed their love of sweets and unhealthy snacks, so I won't binge it, eat at home. How long and how do you want to live the rest of your life? With illness and disease or healthy and active? Are you willing to control the factors in your life that can lead to longevity and quality of life? Get off the couch, get moving, stop eating processed foods and try reducing or eliminating foods with processed sugar. I plan to complete my bucket list and live to be at least 94 years old and I expect to see you there too. Thank you, Ben, for such an informative editorial. My name is Dwanisha, and I'm going to be your host. My guest today is Ram. He's an avid Indian classical artist. He speaks five languages and can understand eight. While he spends a lot of time about foreign Indian classical music, he's also a Silicon Valley engineer. Let's welcome Ram to the show. Welcome, Ram. Hello, Dhani. Glad to be here. Thank you. So when you say Indian classical art, I know it's very wide. What areas do you practice? Uh, I'm very much interested in Indian classical music. Uh, uh, that's more on the South Indian classical music, but I do listen to a lot of uh, North Indian music as well. I've been trained in um, the Southern style and also in epic poetry reading, which mm -hmm. is a musical way of uh, reading, a musical way of singing epic poetry. Sure. Tell us about your journey. How, how long has your association with Indian classical art been and how did it start? Uh, I can probably say it you know, goes, back to, uh, goes back to my childhood. My mother uh, is a vocalist, Indian classical uh, singer. My grandmother was one too, uh, although I, I didn't listen to much of her singing. And my uncle is a performing artist. Okay. Some of my cousins are performing artists. So right from my childhood and of seven or eight years, I've been listening to music. And probably I started learning when I was about 10 years of age. And I still would like to call myself as a student of Indian music rather than a, a performer or, any, or anything. Oh. So you've been involved in music all along, all these years, or was there a break in between? I think uh, I've been involved you know, to a diff various degrees. Um, at sc at during school time, probably it, uh, 
or it was you know less and uh, and also depending on what stage of life I was in, uh, certain things take higher precedence. So, and then probably in the last eight or ten years, probably I'm in, involved more, uh, listening to more music, uh, reading about music, interpreting, and also I've, I've tried in my hand at composing something. Wow. So in the last eight to ten years, it just came back to you. Interesting. Uh, probably, I think it was always the interest was always there, and probably now. Uh, I guess it's because the association of uh, people who have similar in interest as me you know, uh, sort of encouraged me to get into that. Oh, and how did you find these people of sudden? I mean, if I'm not wrong, you, you were in the U.S., not far from Indian classical music roots um, from where you come from. So how did you find all these people out of a sudden eight, eight to ten years ago? Uh, I, think, uh, uh, I think it all started with uh, the Internet. I, I mean, uh, when you are at some location, right, you know, some place, you, if you have friends or whatever, you're limited to that circle. But with the internet, the whole world is your circle. Mm. So it's very easy to, you know, find out people who have similar interests as you and learn from them. So uh, uh, probably in the late 90s when news groups were, you know, coming, mm. uh, coming in, so that's when I caught on to some of the news groups discussing Indian classical music. I learned a lot of stuff there. And, and so it goes on, and then uh, now you have lots of music groups, music uh, forums, online forums, or, uh, or Twitter. It's a very <laughs> interesting place where so you discuss really music. The internet at work, huh? Yes. Or the Silicon Valley at work. Yeah. Interesting. So could you describe Indian classical music? I mean, can you talk about it? When, when I was a child, I tried learning music several times. And I finally gave up, and my teacher, who happened to be a family friend as well, who wanted me to learn music, said, Just stop it, Tony, you can move on uh, and focus on other things. So could you talk to us about music? Describe uh, it. Indian classical music you know, probably has thousands of years of tradition, and some aspects of it hasn't changed at all, while some aspects have changed over time, you know, types of compositions, uh, types of melodies that are used, etc., etc. The major difference be between the Western and the Indian music is Indian music is melodic system, that is what we call, mm -hmm. while the Western music is harmonic. And you're not late if you want to <laughs> pick up some Indian music because uh, right here in the Bay Area, there are plenty of musicians, plenty of teachers uh, teaching music, performing music, concerts happening. And right in this studio, many musical shows have been recorded and telecast. Is that right? Maybe we should pull one of those up and Definitely. see how it sounds. Definitely, yeah. Okay, why don't we listen to a clip then? Sure. Truly surreal. Ram, would you like to talk about this? What was happening here? Uh, this is actually a phenomenal composition. This is a composition of Tyagaraja, what we call. Uh, it's one of the, the one of the kritis called Pancharatna, meaning the five gems. This is first of those five gems. Uh, Tyagaraja was a uh, 18th century composer, lived between 1747 and 1840, uh, 1767, and passed away in 1847. Uh, today's South Indian classical music or Karnataka music owes a lot to him because uh, if you go to a concert, probably half of the compositions that you listen are his. Yeah. And this is one of uh, his magnum opus, I, I could say, Jagadan and the Karaka in, in a raga called Nata. If you saw, uh, there were, you know, uh, uh, there was uh, a, a number of students who were singing, right? Mm -hmm. So they're all, you know, born and brought up in the Silicon Valley. Wow. So I, I must you know, share this with our audience, that this was played or selected right here in the studio. So this is what I mean by he's so learned and so passionate about this topic. 
Uh, switching gears a little bit here, you mentioned poetry, and I know that you're also an author. So you've written a book to yes. your name. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Could you tell us poetry? I mean, how did you get into poetry? That's interesting. Actually, um, I, when I was in my elementary school, my dad enrolled me to uh, learning Sanskrit, an ancient language, which was not part of my school. And it was, uh, it's a language that's not spoken so well, but it has a lot of literature. And it has influenced lots of Indian languages. So there I was introduced uh, to this literature. And it, it actually you know, took my attention to the beauty of the language. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I came engineering studies, et cetera, et cetera, when I, I was totally out of these things. And then, as you said, you, know, you go back to good things. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as I was reading these poems, it occurred to me, why not translate them to a language that more people understand, rather uh, my mother tongue. You know, a lot of people cannot understand Sanskrit okay. in my state. Uh, very few people have studied it. So I thought of uh, translating some of those interesting poems in uh, maybe last six, seven years. Okay. Wow, well, it's um, amazing. You know, wh what you can do living in the Bay Area and just going back to your passion. Thank you again so much for, for being our guest today. Glad if to you here. enjoyed what you saw here today, then once again, this is Toastmasters Beiru Bay, serving San Francisco to Montre Bay. If you enjoy what you saw and would like to find a club near you, please visit d4tm.org. Once again, d4tm.org, and thank you for watching.